Hello and welcome back to the Ghost Droid development series. Today we'll be adding simple player movement and creating a screen wrap handler that will allow any object we attach it to to be able to pretty much be able to wrap from one side of the screen to the other. That's kind of the general plan for the day. We do need to create some other stuff like, you know, actually add ourselves a little level and a background. Now, that's what we're going to start with. And very, very thankfully, that is very, very, very simple. So let's go and start with the level. So to do this, we're going to create a new scene by using the little plus icon up here next to our scene tabs. So add new scene. Now, usually in other playlists or other series, you'll see me do like a 2D scene and then do a tile map. For this, we don't actually need to. We're going to use a user interface node. Now, the reason we're doing this is because the user interface node can actually attach to the size of the screen, right? So we can have a level that is automatically scaled to the size of our screen. Now, why is that important? Well, what we want to do, uh, we'll use Control A or Command A to create a new node or add a new node to the control here. We're going to add a texture rect. And we're going to anchor this to the full screen size or full rect anchor. Now that will pretty much make it so any image we put in here will be the background and it will scale perfectly. Now, scale is a very interesting word because we don't actually want it to scale. We're going to want it to tile. So if I go into the assets folder here and I go into backgrounds, I'm going to grab this dark purple background. I'm going to drag this across into the texture slots in our texture rect. And you'll see that it's really big and it's kind of fuzzy because it's a bit too stretched, right? This is why scaling can be a bit weird. So what we want to do here is under stretch mode, we're going to change this to tile. And now we have this kind of perfect little starry background that's tiled very well and looks actually quite nice. This will do perfectly for us. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hit Control S or Command S and save. I'm going to save this under the scenes folder under a new folder. We're going to call this the level folder. We click OK. And before I save that, I'm going to rename this to level underscore one. And now I'm going to go and save it. So I'm doing level one. I don't know if we're going to do multiple levels, but yeah, it's always nice to do that because then we can just kind of chop and change or swap and change the uh, texture inside of this to add different levels or give a bit of randomization to it so it doesn't always look the same. So that's the level created. Now let's go back into the main scene. So now we are in our main scene, we're going to need to make a quick change. The level container here, its type needs to be changed. Now if we have this as a level or a node 2D or a control uh, node, this won't actually fit the screen correctly. What we need to do here is actually change this to a canvas layer. Now we already have a canvas layer set up for the UI container. So I'm actually just going to add this to the UI container. Just for now, we will, as we kind of add a, a UI to this, we will be changing this around a little bit. But for now, this will do. So to do that, we're going to click on the UI container. We're going to go Control Shift A or Command Shift A. We're going to add level one to that. And you'll see we now have our level sorted. So now all we have to do is actually go and make a player. So to make a player, it's going to be really, really simple. We're going to click the plus icon again. We're going to do the other node button on the create root node. We're going to change this to character body 2D because we're going to want our ship to be a character body. This basically allows us to actually control this. That's kind of what the character body is designed for. So we can have control via keys and right, actual movement and stuff. We're going to rename this to the player ship. Now we're going to need to add a few nodes to this to actually get it to function. First one, we're going to need a sprite 2D because we want to you know, give ourselves a little image. We're going to want a collision shape 2D. And now we just need to add a collision shape and an actual sprite to our ship here. So once again, under the green folders here, under assets, I'm going to go down into the PNG folder. I'm going to scroll down to the player ships. I think I'm going to just do the player ship blue for now. And you'll see two things. One is a little bit fuzzy and two that's quite big compared to our screen size. Now you might be tempted to go to the player ship and scale down the actual character body. You don't actually want to do that. Scaling the character bodies can lead to some very weird and interesting issues. So what we're going to do is just scale down the sprite itself. To do that, we're going to go down into the transform on the right side in the inspector here, where it says scale, we're going to knock this down to 0.4 and maybe that's a little bit too small. Let's go 0.6. That seems about right. 
next thing we're going to want to do is face our ship in its facing direction. Now, because of how we want to handle movement, the facing direction is going to be considered right. So on the x-axis, it's going to go right, so this direction here. So that's the way we want our ship to face. Now, to change that, we're going to go up to the little rotation button up here, or we're going to press E to enter the rotation mode. We're going to hold down Control or Command and click. And that will snap it at 25 or 15 degree increments, 15 degree increments, there we go. And we're going to make sure that is facing right. Now, we're going to hit Control S or Command S and save. We're going to go and create a new folder under our scenes folder. We're going to call this the player folder. We're going to save the ship inside of that. And now we have to add a collision shape. So to add a collision shape, we just click on the collision shape, go to shape, under the drop down menu, we're going to add a circle shape 2D. Now the circle shape is actually a bit small. So what we're going to do is we're going to just increase the size of this just a little bit. We don't want it too big because this is just going to handle uh, physics based collision, right? The next few things we're going to want to add are going to be like hitboxes and things like that. And they're going to want to be a bit bigger than this. So this being tiny is actually pretty good. So let's hit control S and save and make sure that is saved. Let's go back to our main scene here. I'm going to close the level uh, scene that we have open by middle clicking on it. So go back to the main scene, go to the entity container. We're going to hit control shift A or command shift A. We're going to add the player ship. We're going to move this to be roughly centered. Now you'll see here that there's this little bit of an issue with the level and the UI. So there are a few ways of fixing this. The first way is to actually change the UI containers. Uh... So yeah, so what we're going to do here is just go down to the UI container and we're going to lower the layer for the UI container down to negative one. Now that's going to lead to some very interesting issues when it comes to actually adding UI, but we will get to those and we'll fix those as we go. So let's hit control S and save or command S and save. And we now have, if we press play, our little ship in the middle of our screen and a background. Now that ship is still looking just a little bit too big for me. So I'm going to scale this down again to 0.5 instead. I'm going to hit play one more time and make sure, yep, that looks just a little bit better. So now to get moving, because we're going to want our ship to move, right? We're going to want to add a script to the player ship character body. So let's go and do that. And now, if this is your first time doing this, you will be opened up to this if you have uh, like this kind of script, this kind of predefined script, which is you know quite useful if you want to learn this stuff. Uh, I'm going to be starting from scratch, so I'm going to remove a lot of this. And we will kind of design this as we go. So the first big thing that we want to do here is add a class underscore name at the very top of the script, and it's going to be for the player ship. Now, what this allows us to do is reference the class or the player ship and all of its functions or variables inside of other scripts. That way we get some IntelliSense on that and it just kind of makes our lives a bit easier. So we have a class name for player ship. I'm going to hit control S and save. Now we're going to need a few variables. In the previous uh, parts, well, the first part, we kind of broke this down and we realized that the ship movement is going to be acceleration and deceleration based. Now there's going to be a very easy way of designing this, right? We're going to do an exported variable for acceleration underscore speed. It's going to be typed as a float. And I'm going to set this equal to 0.0, .0 for now. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because now we have this exported variable up here that we can mess around with uh, without having to go through the uh, actual code itself, right? We can just do this in the editor, it makes our life a bit easier. So we're going to do another exported variable. And this one's going to be for the deceleration speed. Make sure I'm spelling that correctly. I think I am. Once again, it's going to be a float. So we're going to set that equal to 0.0. .0. Now, the final thing that we want to add is a maximum speed, because if we're just accelerating indefinitely or decelerating indefinitely, we can hit some really ridiculous numbers and we won't be able to see how we're moving because we'll be moving just way too fast. So let's go and add one more exported variable. And this one is going to be for the max underscore speed. And we're going to set this one as a flow and set it equal to, for now, I'm actually going to set this equal to 300, 300.0. Uh, I think 300 is going to be pretty good, but once again, this is a exported variable, so we can mess with it when we actually need to. 
So what's the next thing we need? Well, we're going to need access to the physics process. So to get access to that, we're going to write func underscore physics, and then you'll get this intelligence here for the physics process. And we're going to hit enter, and then we'll hit enter again to enter the function. And for now, write pass. So we now have access to the physics function. We just need things to put inside of it. And we don't really have anything to put inside of it like right now. So let's actually go and add some things or create some new functions that we can put inside of it. I think the very first one is going to be very simple and very kind of important, and that is going to be looking at the mouse position. Now we could do this code inside of the physics process. Personally, I like to separate things into more or separate, fun separate functions just because it allows me to individually take things apart piece by piece and change tiny things like here and there that can actually have a really large impact. So Look, uh, take the look at mouse function that we're about to create, for example. So let's go create this. Look at underscore mouse underscore position. Position. There we go. I have cold hands today, so it's uh, a bit of a pain to type. I'm going to add a uh, minus and then a arrow here to make it void. That basically says that there is nothing returning from this. Just makes it uh, run just a little bit faster. We can do the same thing to the physics process, so we can do that. Once again, just makes it run just a little bit faster. Not that important, but it's something I like to do, and a good thing to get into the habit of doing. So for looking at the mouse position, we need to first get the mouse position. So let's create a new variable inside of this for mouse underscore position. And we're going to set that as a vector two, because our position will be a vector two uh, array of sorts. Or is it an array? I guess a vector two is an array technically speaking, but yes, <laughs> we want it to be a vector two, and we are going to want to just do something very simple and use get underscore global mouse position. And we're going to be storing that inside of this variable. So it's just a bit easier to use. We don't have to type out this whole get string here. Now to finish this off, we're just going to use the look at functionality. This will point our characters facing direction or our forward direction on the X towards the mouse position. So we're going to use look at and then pass through the mouse position. Now I'm going to put this inside of the physics process. I'm just going to call that by going look at mouse position and that's it. We should now have a sprite or our ship should now be tracking our mouse position perfectly. Now the perfectly is a very key word here because this goes back to what I was saying about changing minuscule things that can have a really large impact. So what if you wanted to have the ship very slowly face towards the mouse. Well, that would actually change how you move quite a bit in a game like this. So that would be a very, very large change for just a small, simple function. So in this case, separating it into its own function can actually be quite important. So let's actually go and test this real quick. Let's hit play. Now, as you can see, the ship is now centered on the mouse or it's staring at the mouse. So no matter which way I do it, it's always going to look at the mouse. If I pass through it, it's going to snap to it as fast as it can and that keeps our mouse being tracked. So we now have our looking direction sorted. We now need to just handle the acceleration. So let's go and create a new function for this. It's going to be func handle underscore acceleration. This is going to actually need something. Well, it's not going to need something passed into it. It's a good idea to pass something into it. And by something, I mean delta. Delta is kind of allows you to keep it frame, is it frame locked or unlocked from the frame rate basically means it works a little bit better. We're not going to need to do that this time. We will probably add that in the future when a bit more necessary, but there shouldn't be any frame rate related issues with this game because it's going to be a very small game. Once again, that's another thing you ought to think about. It's very easy to get into the design everything perfectly as fast as possible with, you know, a, a kind of very complex thing, but you can end up digging yourself a bit of a hole where you end up uh, optimizing too quickly or optimizing yourself to death <laughs> when it comes to developing. So we're not going to go over optimal with this. We're going to just kind of start from a foundation and build up and kind of add optimization as we need to as we go. So with the handle acceleration function, well, first we need to go to our project, project settings, our input map, and we need to make sure we remember that we've added these actions here. So this is the accelerate and the fire actions. We're only going to need accelerate. So we have this function defined, we have keys added to this. Now, if you don't have this, to add a new action, you type in the name of the action in this box, you click add, 
and then you click the plus sign and you press whichever key you want to have as the key to activate that action. So we want to accelerate and that's going to be W or up on our keyboard. Okay, so how do we get that into code? Well, we use an if statement. We go if input, so we're actually accessing the input functionality of Godot, dot is action just pressed or pressed or just released. So depending on how those go, you know, we'll actually do something. We're actually going to want to go is underscore action action pressed. So if we are currently pressing the button, we're going to want to then use the accelerate. Uh, well, if the accelerate button specifically is being pressed. So if W or up are being pressed, we want it to do something. So what do we want it to do? Uh, let me add some space here so we can actually see what's going on a little bit. There we go. What do we want to actually do? Well, we want to modify our velocity and get ourselves moving towards the mouse. So how do we go about that? Well, first let's access the velocity. And then we know we want to set it equal to something. So let's set that equal. Well, we want it to move towards something, right? So, okay, uh, velocity dot, there is a move towards functionality that we can use, which will move the velocity, which is a vector two, towards another vector two by a specific increment. That's very useful for us. So what do we want to move it towards? Well, here is where it can get a bit weird. There's a lot of different types of math you can do to accomplish this type of movement. We're going to use something very simple. We're going to grab the transform dot x. This is basically grabbing the forward facing position of our character and moving it towards a certain point. So what's the certain point? Well, it's going to be the transform.x, so forward facing dot x times the max speed. So we are timesing our transform.x by, in this case, 300, and that's kind of where we want our velocity to move towards or our, that vector two to move towards. That will make it so it moves towards that exact point that we are currently having our mouse on Or, you know, it'll basically move towards our mouse at uh, this, a certain speed, and it will just kind of keep doing that until it hits the max speed. Now, how fast do we want to do that by? Well, we want to do it by the acceleration speed. This will make it so that now we will accelerate up to our transform.x times our max speed, so vector2 times 300 by the acceleration speed. This will add very, very nice and smooth acceleration to our plane or our ship. So after that, I'm going to do a return statement. This will basically say, you know, if this is being pressed, do nothing else after this code. Perfect. But if this is not being pressed, so this is, if this is not true, we want to run something else. We want to run a new velocity. We want to go set that equal to velocity dot move towards. And now we're going to want to pass in a new vector two. This one is going to be vector two dot zero. And then we're going to want to do that by the deceleration speed. This will basically slow our ship down by the deceleration speed amount. So what do we got to do next to actually get this to uh, kind of be able to test this and use this? Well, under the physics process, we need to do two things. We need to call our handle acceleration. Lord, we can call our handle acceleration function. And then we call a very specific function. And that is going to be called the move underscore and slide. That is a character body 2D specific functionality that actually allows it to start modifying velocity and do things. So let's hit control S and save. Let's go and hit the play button. And let's see what happens right now. Nothing. Why is nothing happening? Well, as you can see up here, we still have our acceleration and deceleration set to zero. So let's change the acceleration speed, right? Uh, we will do this inside of the player ship scene to make sure that it gets saved across. So let's go seven and one. Let's hit play. And as you can see, we are slowly coming to a stop and we are slowly accelerating. But this is as fast as we can possibly go now. And I think this is a good speed. And as you can see, when I try to turn really quickly, it's got to kind of counteract the speed that it's going and slow down and then come to a stop and then keep moving. I think this feels really good because it adds a kind of drifty sensation to the ship, which means you have to be as precise as possible with your movements to try and dodge things. Now that's great, but here's a new little issue we run into, right? If I go off the screen, well, we are now gone. <laughs> we are now completely off the screen. I now have to like turn the ship all the way around. Let's do that. Let go of the mouse or let go of the acceleration button and it's just kind of gone. So. Let's see how long it takes to get back. A little while. 
So what we want to do now is handle the wrapping of the ship, right? We want to make it so it can wrap between the corners and the tops and bottoms of the actual screen. So to do that, we're going to create a fun little thing I like to call a handler. It's basically a node which controls a specific functionality that you can then put or attach to anything. Designing it for our player ship this way means we can attach it to the player ship, asteroids, uh, UFOs, pretty much anything we want to be able to screen wrap. So let's go and do that. We're going to want to create a new scene of node 2D type. We're going to switch to the 2D here. Node 2D type. I'm going to call this the screen wrap handler. I'm going to hit control S and save, go up a path, I'm going to create a new folder here for the handlers, I'm going to save the screen wrap handler inside of that folder. And now all I'm going to do is add a script to it. We don't actually need to do much to this other than add a script. I'm going to add a class underscore name and this will be the screen wrap handler. And we are going to need access to the process function, but not the ready function. So let's get rid of these comments here and just add a few things. What are we going to need to add? Well, we are going to need to first get the size of our screen. And we can do that on ready. So on ready basically means when the ready function fires or when this node becomes ready, we want to do something specific. So in this case, we want to on ready create a variable for the screen underscore size. This is going to be of type vector2 and it's going to be set equal to the get underscore viewport underscore rect. Now you'll notice that I didn't get any uh, autocorrect for that and that's technically because it is a rect2 type of uh, variable but I'm just going to save this as a vector2 because it kind of stores it in the same way so it should be fine. So we want to get viewport size rect dot size. Now that will basically contain the X and Y size of our screen and store it with inside this vector2 called screen size. Now the next thing we want to do is an exported variable. We're going to call this the owner underscore node. And we'll set this equal to a node 2D type because every node that we plan on using will inherit from node 2D. We'll set it equal to null. Now there's a few ways you can do this. You don't need to do this as an exported variable. You could actually set up a function. Let's go do that. Let's go func set underscore parent. It will be of void return type. And then we can just go owner node is equal to uh, get underscore parent. And that will set the owner node equal to the get parent. Now there's a reason why I don't want to do this specifically, and that is because we may change the structure of our character and stuff. For now, let's uh, just go and make sure that works. Very easy way to do that is to set up the ready function. So func underscore ready, and then use set underscore parent inside of the ready function. And we can then change this from an exported variable to a normal variable, and we can just keep it set as null like so. That kind of removes one extra thing from our inspector here and will auto set the parent for us. So let's go and now set up the actual uh, object wrap functionality. So to do that, we're going to write func handle underscore object underscore wrap. It will require no parameters and will be of type void uh, for the return type. And now we're going to need to just kind of check a few different positions. Now, we can do this quite quickly and simply. Now, there's a reason why I have the owner node, right? Because we need to know where the owner actually is in space. Now, we don't technically need the owner to do this, but knowing how to get the parent and set it to a variable can be quite useful for future things. So we're going to keep that. It just means we're going to have to extend our code just a little bit right now. So to do this, we're going to write if owner node dot position dot x so the x position of our owner right is greater than the screen size dot x what are we going to want to do well we're going to want to then set the owner node dot position dot x equal to zero basically this is saying if we go past the screen size dot x cap or the maximum size for the screen size in the x direction we want to go and set our position originally back to zero basically if we're going from like on the right side of the screen we will then get set to the left side of the screen that's perfect 
So the next one is going to be the less than, right? So if owner node dot position dot x is less than zero. So on the left side of the screen, what do we want to do? Well, we want to actually go and set the owner node dot position dot x equal to the screen size dot x. So basically, we're just doing the inverse of the original if statement that we've done here. This handles the left and right sides of the screen. So I'm going to add a little bit of a layer of separation here so we can see the Y part of this now. It's going to be very simple. Owner node dot position dot Y is greater than the screen size dot Y. Then what do we want to do? Well, we want to set the owner node dot position dot y equal to you guessed it zero and now we're going to want to once again go and create the inverse for this so owner node dot position dot y is less than screen size dot y same as the functionality up here before hell we could even copy this one line here the owner node position dot x paste it into the y down here and then change the two x's to y's and there you go, we are now handling the screen wrap. Now I'm throwing this inside of the process function. So we're going to go and fire that in the process function and make sure it's called. Why are we using process and not physics process? We don't actually need this to be called as often as the physics process gets called. The normal process will actually work quite well for this and it will, once again, small optimization that's completely unnecessary but is doable because it's just one line of code. It just makes it run a bit smoother. So let's hit control S and save. Uh, let's now go back to our player ship go to the player ship's root node, we'll left click on it. We're then going to use control shift A or command shift A. We're going to add a screen wrap handler to it. We're going to hit control S and save. We're going to hit play and we're going to go and see if that functionality has worked. As you can see, it's not entirely working. Now, why is it not working? Well, it is not working because of this here. I uh, made a little mistake here. This should be less than zero. There we go, let's go and try that again. Okay, we are now able to fully fly around. Let's go fly from the bottom to the top. Okay, let's go fly from the left to the right. That's working fine, right to left, and top to bottom. We now have perfect screen wrap for pretty much any object we want to actually have screen wrap in this game. And that pretty much covers it. Now, the reason why we designed it as a handler like so is it allows us to, as I said, attach this screen wrap handler node to other things like the asteroids or the ships and we now have no extra setup to do we just do that and they can now automatically wrap around the screen if they move in one of those directions so that is pretty much going to be this video covered thank you for watching i hope you are having a great day and a great game dev journey and i will see you in the next video